Well, with us now are Nick Ferrari, the former tabloid journalist, himself a hacking victim and now a presenter for LBC. Rich Pepiat, a former Daily Star reporter and now a filmmaker. Professor Honora O'Neill, a political philosopher who gave evidence to the Leveston inquiry. And Isabel Hardman, who's assistant editor of The Spectator. Thank you all so much for coming in. Um, Rich Pepiat, firstly to do you. We heard there already stories are being sanitised, they're being spiked. There are things the public is not finding out enough about because of changes in all of this. As somebody who was in the tabloid press and has now sort of forsworn your past, doesn't that concern you or is, is that what you wanted? No, I mean, I, I think that, you know, you could look at it from another perspective. Maybe there were stories being printed in the, the first place that shouldn't have been printed at all. Uh, whether, that, you know, that's a good process that some stories are maybe being spiked. Uh, I can think if we're talking about the sun here, Hillsborough. You know, maybe that one should have been spiked that wasn't. There's plenty of stories, you know, I think there's plenty of stories that aren't being written about that should be written about. Um, you know, the Snowden leaks, a massive press freedom, massive journalism story, you're not going to read much about it in the sun. And I think that, you know, there is two ways of looking at that. And I think that, you know, maybe it's time for the Sun and some of the other tabloids to slightly change their tact and the sort of stories they're going after, rather than the easy hits about celebrities, but really investing in proper investigative journalism. I and mean, there's not enough opportunities for young journalists going into the industry to do that. Instead, it's the bikini pictures on the beach. Nick Ferrari. I think newsrooms up and down the land tomorrow will be asking why, why, why. What we haven't focused on, what has not been said, is the incredible cost. You've had various commentators talking about the Leveson inquiry, £6 million. You've got a headline in tomorrow's Daily Telegraph, £100 million. So that's well over £100 million for what? One editor, one editor found guilty, five people cleared. It has clearly been bungled, poorly executed, and you wonder why on earth they've done it. It's kept some investigative reporters in work, that's all right, and they've won some awards. Apart from that, the public don't care, we've just but, heard the jury. But, but people have been found guilty here, six people one, have been found guilty. One person. In, before the start of the they trial. They chose not to be put on trial, but, so But in terms, guilty, though, so. of the impact on this, we heard there in that film, Dave Wooding, political yep. journalist, saying stories are being spiked, stories are being sanitised. Is that, as Rich says, a good thing? Is that what well, we did know. after all? You'd have to tell but, me the stories. But I mean, if, for instance, you've got a cabinet minister who's having a problem with drugs, then I would think it's probably a good idea that we know about it. If you've got a, a Premier League football player who's running around with cool girls in hotels, actually, I don't really care. It doesn't affect my life. The idea that a prominent politician is getting away with thieving, with inappropriate behaviour, it could affect my life. Until I know the stories, I can't comment. But in terms of the effect that it's having on the press, the sort of nervousness that does seem to have spread. The problem is, Professor Nora, there is a sort of stalemate because some parts of the press say, yes, that's jolly good. And some parts of the press say, no, it's sending a chill up all of our spines. Why is there a stalemate here in terms of how people are trying to move on? I actually don't see that there should be a stalemate. The press enjoy freedom of expression and nobody has spoken out against that. Leveson's recommendations were for self-regulation to continue, but with an audit body to make sure that it was robust self-regulation. This is a privilege, after all, that other professions no longer have. They are only partially self-regulated. So that the proposed audit body that Leveson recommended seems to me not something to get timid about. It's something to, as it were, take in one stride and create a good press that really does serious investigative journalism, as you say. The real thing, not the tawdry celeb substitute that we're getting. But the chances so far of the majority of the press accepting that, the Royal Charter, are tiny. I mean, they're just not going to go along with it, are At they? At the moment, there is only one body which, which is uh, uh, IPSO, uh, Independent Press Standards Organization, son of PCC, and they've said that they won't apply to be audited uh, and uh, I suppose they're timid that they could meet and standards. Having, and having testified at Leveson, are you satisfied with what you've seen so far? Does it meet his requirements? Uh, what we have at this stage does not meet his requirements. But, and I recently put a question in the House of Lords whether it would be satisfactory if the only self-regulating body for the press refused to be audited. I can't say the minister was able to answer so that should, question. So, so briefly, should the government force the Royal Charter on the press? 
the whole point about the Royal Charter is that it is not forced. There is no state regulation of the press proposed, despite a certain amount of shrieking. <laughs> well, Isabel, one of the people who's been doing that shrieking, to use <laughs> your term, is, is, is your editor, has basically said he would rather go to jail than agree with what the government suggested. Good on, you. Good on him. Oh, I can't imagine Fraser Nelson ever shrieking, but <laughs> I think that the thing that's characterised the spectator throughout its history has been a really healthy lack of trust in politicians. And one of the things that appalled us about press regulation was it gave politicians the opportunity to get their hands on regulation of the media. Now, I'm not going to be hysterical and say that they're able to shut down newspapers or, or force stories to be spiked, but what we've seen at The Spectator is politicians suddenly gleefully seizing the opportunity, or what they think is the opportunity, presented by press regulation to try to shut yeah. down stories they find inconvenient. We've had politicians calling our editor trying to stop writers publishing stories that are just inconvenient. And in your view, that's new? Yes. No, Ferrari. Uh, respectfully, you can't have a little bit of regulation. It's you can't be a little bit pregnant. Either the government has got its fingers on it or it hasn't. And this idea put forward by supporters when they're all eating pizza at two o'clock in the morning doing shady deals where the press aren't even invited, that it's just going to be like an MOT. Respectfully, madam, it's cobblers. It's not. It's intervention. It's control. And it's everything that this country has fought against. Thank God. Well, let's Sorry. wind back there one second, because I think that you find the newspaper groups had ten times as many meetings uh, with politicians didn't as hacked off produce, anyone ever didn't had. didn't produce any laws, and though, did it, or any recommendations. That's been denied it even happened, but it gets repeated and repeated, and that's the worst way that the worst parts of our press well, work, is that they repeat you're not good falsehoods on facts, again and, and again and again. Because the Deputy Prime Minister said on my LBC show that they ate pizza. So get facts right, young <laughs> man. But, but isn't what flavour was it? Did you get a top in, or matter? did you get the details? Isn't, that isn't, it, isn't it, however, part part of being a politician to talk to the press. I mean, they have to have connections, they have to have links, do they not? Of course they do. They have to win elections and they're very dependent on the media. I think what we have to understand is that this is a power relationship and what we have to think about is how do we sustain freedom of expression, which I take to be really important in the face of those who wish it to be controlled either by the press or by the politicians. But and I think that we have to find a way of mediating that. Leveson's proposal, taken seriously and not looking at all the stuff that has been said about it, is actually very clever because it is not state regulation of the media. It does not permit censorship of but content. You he but you hear already, before the full version is even up and running, we already have politicians trying to use, e use it to shut down stories that Pol they don't want to be Politicians will always try that. Politicians run very scared of the press. You have to recognise this. And I'm sure that they don't all behave well. We have very good evidence of that too. But it isn't a one-way story here. And self-regulation is a privilege that we accord to no other powerful body. So I think we have to think very hard about how we sustain self-regulation without falling into the... We are, area running, where we've been. we are running out of time. Isabel Hardman. Well, pizza aside, one of the least impressive things that this Parliament has done has been to force through the legislation that enabled the Royal Charter in an afternoon, the day after those press talks late at night. MPs voted on that legislation with no scrutiny of it whatsoever. You talk to many Conservative MPs now I, I, and they are horrified at what they've voted I think you for. should remember that it isn't legislation. Well, there, I sat in the bill. And it was overwhelmingly, in the Commons. how many times do you see all political parties join and vote through a certain thing? And then the press, the thing, arrogance though? to ignore it and say, we're above that. That shows a level of arrogance that we can ignore the will of Parliament. Right. The who elected Rupert right, Murdoch? Who elected Lord Rothmere? Paul Dacre to decide we don't want to do that. They get elected. They're not elected. They get elected. Every day by their readers. Okay, we're going to have to see. We're going to. We're going to.